um, last session of the web ODV part. Overall, what we want to do in this uh, remaining two hours, <coughs> refine a little bit uh, quality control because uh, the project considers performing quality control in a unified way by the data center people as something important. And uh, so we are spending quite some time on quality control. Uh, but then also uh, come to the other two um, services that WebODV uh, offers. <clears throat> so everybody please um, start with the home page of the VRE, like this one, should become familiar now to you. And um, click on WebODV quality control. Can I, can I see a show of hands who did quality control on the imported data sets? Were there people doing it? Not so much. Success? Did you feel like you are doing something useful? I mean, hopefully. <clears throat> people don't seem to be uh, so sure about this. <clears throat> so, um, let's continue doing a QC on the dirty data set, which is like the prepared data set. So everybody please uh, see the private workspace, ODV course material, QC, dirty data set, oops. Select it and then click continue just to bring us back So before lunch everything worked just nicely uh, In your case, do you still have the map? So um, you can realize I, I don't see it. I'm, I'm trying to rescue myself <clears throat> oh no. So in, in my case, I, I really have to stop and try from the beginning. Okay. <clears throat> so, um, I don't see a show of hands, so I'm assuming uh, you are all with me. In order to speed up things and reduce the workload on the server, let us zoom into this map so that we have a smaller set of stations. Everybody zooms into the favorite region, right? So in my case, I'm, I'm using this explicit option. I'm manipulating the corners. And this time um, I'm visiting here this area. And because I don't see the dots, because they are now too small, I go to properties, make these dots larger. And all of these steps we have done before, I'm just repeating so that, that you gain some familiarity and, and are not surprised by things that happen. And in this case, um, we want to do a little bit more advanced quality control using additional parameters. And in a way, um, I'm, I'm addressing biogeochemistry. At some point, the project, or at least Emotnet Chemistry, which is associated here, has to quality control uh, nutrient and oxygen data. So in a way, uh, I'm, I'm going into this area. <clears throat> so I want to have um, a lot of scatter windows to look at different nutrients at the same time. So put the mouse over the canvas area. Um, oh, and, and for now, let us use a different option. Like here, just above the load view, there is layout templates, and you should see um, a lot of choices, which in my case... The um, uh, they they got um, how to say I I couldn't see the entire uh, menu so sometimes it might be necessary to start this 
from a lower mouse position, layout template, and, and now I'm seeing the full list of choices. Because the one I, I want to use is uh, here, six scatter windows. <coughs> this will produce a, a window layout that you have seen before, but before we load it in an already prepared view. Um, and by default, it's um, all of them are scatter windows, which means all the data from all the stations that are currently shown in the map, in my case, 428 stations, all the data from, from these set of stations, they are shown in these windows. So that would show us all the oxygen data um, here, all the nitrate, silicate, and so on. And, um, well, I realize there are no experts for the biogeochemistry, or maybe just a few. Um, let us look at nitrate down here in this. And if you look very careful, there are very high values near the surface. So if you click into these areas, you actually find these very high nitrate values. While uh, most of the other ones, they, they are much smaller. So are these bad data? How can we find out whether there's a river? So the first, the first thing you should look at, well, where in the map are these located? And, and we find they are located here. Now we need our Spanish colleagues. Is there a river in this region? Come on. You must know where the Spanish rivers meet the Mediterranean. So if we don't know geographically, is there any other way to determine whether this is river water? Ah, let's look at salinity. So these high values here, I'm, I'm clicking on, on one of these points arbitrarily. So I happen to have a sample that also has salinity. So in this case, we would realize, oh, definitely, this only has salinity two point something whereas the open Mediterranean has 38 point something. So that clearly seems to indicate, yes, we have a river. In order to study these, these relationships uh, even closer, I'm kind of recommending that we do some analysis. And, and I'm advertising it's possible in this web interface. So let's do it. In addition, to having nitrate profiles in, in this window here. Let us set up this window to the left to also have nitrate on the x-axis. And then on the y-axis, let's put salinity just to see whether there's a relationship between the two. Okay, how do we put nitrate on the x-axis of this window? Mouse over it, right click x variable <clears throat> and then instead of silicate we are choosing nitrate apply and now we want to put salinity on the y-axis so same thing mouse over the window right click but now we are choosing y variable and instead of depth we are choosing salinity apply and now we get a picture like this so to everybody who's wondering whether some strange looking data are real or, or, or bad data, such looking at a, at a specific window can help to decide. So here we realize there's actually a very strict linear relationship between salinity. So when salinity is very low, concentrated river water we have the highest uh, nitrate. And when salinity increases, when we are going more and more open Mediterranean water, uh, nitrate goes smaller. So this looks like this river 
is highly contaminated with nitrate. So I'm speculating the agricultural industry in this region is discharging into the river, leading to huge nitrate concentrations in the river. When that is um, getting into the Mediterranean, you actually see it. And this definitely does not look like bad data, otherwise you wouldn't get this very strict correlation with salinity. So whenever you are wondering whether these data should be flagged, this should be enough information to say, oh no, they're good data. Maybe the environmental agency hates to see this, but this, this is real, okay? Um, some, some other useful um, correlation uh, could be, especially when you are dealing with uh, nutrients, could be calculating ratios of nitrate versus some other nutrient like phosphate. So maybe some of you have heard about these red field ratios. And it turns out in the ocean, nitrate and, and phosphate, they are tightly correlated. And the reason is algae that are taking up phosphate and, and nitrate, they need to take it up in, in certain ra ratios that has to do with life, with the kind of um, uh, amino acids and, and sugars and everything that is produced by the phytoplankton. They need phosphate and nitrate in, in pretty much fixed ratios. So a hundred years ago, people found out, damn, this is pretty hard this ratio. So it's, it's quite useful to um, calculate these ratios and look at them just to determine whether uh, given phosphate and nitrate data look good or look bad. And now let's learn how to uh, get a derived variable again. I think we did it before with the QC value, but now um, we are requesting a ratio. So the mouse has to be over the list of variables that we have because we want to extend it, the list. Right click, the arrived variable. <coughs> and I think it's the first group, yeah. In the first group, expressions, derivatives, and so on, um, the lower part is ratio. So we are requesting a ratio and then everybody should see a dialog uh, derived variable ratio. And now we specify what's in the numerator and what's in the denominator. And the classical ratio in, in biogeochemistry is to have nitrate in the numerator and have phosphate in the denominator. Just ignore for a moment this, this zero here, just keep it and apply. And that's all that is needed to request um, this ratio derived variable. Um, anybody um, suggests to have an additional derived variable while we are here? No? Maybe oxygen nitrate, because that's another one that many people like. So why not have a second one? Ratio again, but now we put oxygen on top. Uh, no, phosphate in the denominator. It's always um, reference to phosphate. So we have a second one, and, and now I click apply here. <clears throat> and um, so why not now that we want to use the ratio information to determine whether values are good or bad? Um, well, why not change here the oxygen plot to have the ratio on the x-axis? So mouse over this plot, right click, x variable. Um, open this list. Very down at the bottom, we have the ratio nitrate versus phosphate. This is the one. And apply. So that shows um, these ratio values. Now we see very big one near the surface. And do we have an expert here for these ratios? Is this real or not? So again, when you click on these points, that, that takes you again to the river plume here. So it, it seems like in the river plume, we have these gigantic um, ratios. 
Any expert? Real or not? Real? Or bad data? Well, these biologists, they would say, well, in, in rivers and, and in, the, in the plume nearby, you can have it. Anything. So it depends very much on the uh, runoff pattern, what, what enters the river, and these kind of things. So it can be very non red fieldian, as they say. So if you are close to the coast, you should be prepared to have all kinds of strange things and, and don't flag them as bad data easily. Right? In this case, I would not do it. But um, there's also quite big variation in the deep. Just to have a, a better look at them, we need to zoom into this. Mouse over the window, right click, zoom, and let us just look at the smaller range of values, like something like this. <clears throat> and then apply. So now we have a better look at, at the deep values. So one thing, um, most of these values here in the deep, if you click at them, they look like, if you were an expert, this is what you expect in the Mediterranean uh, as real nitrate to phosphate ratios. But, but then there are some that are quite high, like here, or even this one. And these would be then points that you could consider flagging as bad or not. So let me summarize. There are two things that I wanted to, to show you uh, quickly. Um, there are possibilities built into this web interface that allow you to, to get all kinds of derived variables that can help you to decide whether points are good or bad and give you guidance on how to flag them. Um, and the second one is like the first one. So lots of possibilities, ratios is one example. Um, in the interest of not spending too much time, I'm, I'm prepared to skip this density business, unless some people would really like to see it. So density, um, just in principle, um, helps you to find outliers because we know in the ocean density always increases when we go down. It has to. Um, and you could use uh, density uh, just to find so-called inversions, where the data indicate that a deeper water mass has less density than above. You know already this one is bad. Because in the ocean, this is not stable. The light one below will come up. It just cannot happen. And this principle can help you to find so-called density inversions. For this purpose, just quickly, without you having to follow, we would um, request a density-derived variable. Mouse over this area, right-click, derived variables. Um, you would go to physical properties, TEOS 10. These are the new formulas in, in physical oceanography. You open it, there are many, many, many variables that you could choose. The one for these density inversions would be um, potential density anomaly. Again, you would keep this zero and you have it. And, and then you could plot density in some graphics and, and try to detect when it's uh, decreasing with depth. And, and this would be uh, definitely bad data. Um, and now I, I would be prepared to close this quality control uh, business. Any questions? Maybe a quick one. Uh, I'm not sure. Does she need the microphone? Okay. Oh, oh, yes, yes, yes. Okay. So um, actually here in this dirty data set, um, there, there are stations on land. And I, I bet you have seen this happening before, right? So obviously, uh, well, either there's a river and, and they are taking river samples. But then um, here in this case, this station on um, inland, it claims to have samples between 0 and 2,040 meters. 
I don't know of any river that is 2,040 meters deep. So that definitely looks like um, the position of this station is wrong. And it, it, uh, it actually is an ocean station, but, but happens to have wrong longitude or latitude. So what can we do? If we don't have the lock of the ship, I, I would claim huh, we can't do anything because it's, it's placed on land, we, we know it's wrong, but what is the right longitude, what is the right latitude? But if you have the logbook of that cruise, then you are able to, to just verify uh, what was wrong. And let's assume we know what was wrong and, and let's learn how you could correct it. So far, we, are, we were only changing quality flags, but now we are actually editing the metadata, right? Okay, so let's assume um, the latitude was wrong and I'm correcting the latitude. So we are changing the metadata of this station, the one that is currently selected. These metadata, they are listed here in this top list window. So the mouse has to go there, right click, and then choose edit the metadata. This option. Everybody please do it. <clears throat> and everybody should see uh, this dialog. Now this dialog has um, the list of uh, meta variables on the left and the values that it currently has. Now, if we know the, the latitude is wrong, then please double click on this latitude value that should be highlighted now in blue and start entering uh, the new value. And let me enter uh, 40. So I will bring it further south, this station. Four zero, oops. Why am I not getting numbers? Ah, four zero. So if this is the new value, <clears throat> then type it in and press apply. Be prepared, the map will be reproduced, recreated, and this point will move. So I say apply, and it's now moved to, to this location. Okay. All this editing is locked, so let us retrieve uh, the, the lock records for this station. Right click on station ID, browse station history. Hmm. Hmm. Uh, no. Hmm? I, I cannot hear. Yeah, okay. So I'm. Hmm. So I'm trying to summarize to the remote uh, listeners. Um, uh, Lumi is suggesting to just um, look at neighboring stations from the same cruise, and they could be um, obtained by the arrow buttons, left and right button, or clicking these buttons here. That will take you to the previous station, next station. So you could visit the, the um, neighboring stations and just see where they are located and then find out the new position by, by averaging in the middle of, of a pair. But um, 
However you find the correct values, that's your business. I, I have shown you how to enter them, but I'm surprised not to get the, um, the station history. Hmm. Too bad. Um, but I can say um, this action was also locked and um, it, it will show what the previous value was and what the new value was, who did it, when, and so on. Any other question concerning uh, quality control? <clears throat> okay, so um, let's close this session in the official way. Mouse over the canvas, right click, close session. And that will take us back to the home page of the VRE, hopefully. Yeah. So now um, I, I will keep visualization as, as the final aspect and um, let's jump to uh, extraction. So we now have a qualified data set and now somebody is coming and saying, well, I don't want the entire data set, but just the part from a given domain, uh, maybe certain cruises, um, certain time period, that's all that I want to have. And this service is provided by this last uh, item here, Web ODV Data Extractor. So everybody please click on it. <clears throat> and now let's again try to, to be synchronized. Everybody follow the same steps. So everybody should have this selection of data sets and when Ever somebody doesn't have it, please raise your hand so we can correct it. These are data sets that have been prepared um, in the C Data Net and C Data Cloud uh, project, and they are available. And here we are making them available for extraction. Any favorite domain? Mediterranean. Mediterranean? Why not having a different uh, ocean? We did quality control in the Mediterranean already. So if we want to put hard load on the uh, Orca server in Hamburg, then we would choose North Atlantic because this is the biggest one. If we want to be kind to them, why not go to the Baltic? Okay, so we are kind. Okay, Baltic. But, but actually, if you like a different region, choose your own region. So the map will look different, but the principles are the same. So Baltic. So this is the prepared um, C Data Cloud uh, data set um, that C Data Cloud is making public for the Baltic. <clears throat> and imagine we, we don't want to... Uh, and. The web interface now actually tells us it's 358,000 stations, which is a lot of stations. So we definitely want to create an export with that many. So why not um, have a geographical um, zoom? And now remember the import and the export, they have a different interface. This one is not um, mouse sensitive, but we have buttons on the left side that allow us to, to interact. So zooming here is performed by clicking this button zoom. <clears throat> and obvious um, rectangles appear. I'm, I'm moving it here in, in this region. But you can have your, your favorite domain. Once you are satisfied, uh, you click the apply button, which happens to be here on the left side. So that now narrows the um, geographical space. We have 19,000 station only now. The next typical um, thing is that you uh, select a time window and you can set uh, a starting and an end date. And this you can practice on your own. 
once we do uh, um, in once we once we do the uh, hand-on exercises. But I also want to um, draw your attention to this one: required variables. Sometimes you want to make sure that a certain variable actually has data. Now, if, if this was a, a biogeochemical data set, you could maybe ask for oxygen really being present. And then all stations that do not have oxygen would not be shown. You would not be bothered. So in this case, because this is just TNS, we can still try. <clears throat> and we can say, OK, we only want to see stations that have salinity. Very often, like XPT data, you don't have salinity. So by requiring a salinity, th that essentially means we are excluding XPTs because they don't have salinity. And the apply button is here on the right side. <clears throat> um, this interface actually shows you that we have requirement, that we are requiring uh, salinity. Um, so, this is to summarize that for selecting stations, which is the first step in this whole navigation, you, you have several possibilities. Geographically, time window requiring that certain data are present. Um, once this is done, then we go to the second step. Yeah. Click on this navigation bar uh, second. <clears throat> this is the step where you request what you want in the output, right? And why not request that we have temperature and salinity in the output file? If you have a more complicated data set like uh, nutrients, oxygen, uh, or even in Emotnet chemistry, you can have contaminants, which can be hundreds of different complicated variables. You would select exactly what you want. And maybe you don't want DDT and, and some other things, but maybe you want to have mercury. So that's the step where you make your selection of what. All the other variables that you do not select, they will not be in the output, right? Okay, so that is <clears throat> step two, very simple here. And step three already brings us to the output. And here in the output, you decide uh, what should be the output format. So what is your favorite uh, format? And what we are offering, spreadsheet, that's kind of the ASCII uh, spreadsheet format. ODV collection, if you are ODV-centric person, then it, it will generate a collection ready to be used by ODV. Uh, if you are a NetCDF person, you would choose NetCDF. Um, World Ocean Circulation Experiment, hydrographic program, maybe nobody knows about here in this context. So maybe that's not very popular. Uh, any choice? NetCDF? Who knows how to deal with NetCDF? Not too many. So what's your preferred spreadsheet then maybe? Okay. Um, so once you click on your uh, preferred format, it, it actually starts the extraction and it will uh, prepare the, the output. For this course, realizing that there are 40 or 50 people doing this simultaneously, uh, Sebastian Miro, who has set up the service for the course, he is interfering in the last step and he's saying only the data from the last year will be exported no matter what you have chosen. <laughs> this is uh, just to please merit so that the Orca server in Hamburg uh, keeps happy. But of course, eventually, we will take off this restriction and what you select, you will get. Um, and that's it <clears throat> concerning extraction. Um, so this file, um, at, at some place, 
uh, will, will turn up in your private workspace with some delay and, and maybe you get an email again uh, telling you where that is. Okay, so extraction, um, pretty easy, isn't it? Any question concerning extraction? Uh, then let us go back to the home page again of the VRE <clears throat> and, and spend some time, uh, um, maybe question? Okay, so the question, the question was about um, the, the size limitations on the export, right? Yes. Well, for the course, it's pretty clear, it's, it's a radical. Um, for the future, I, I think this will be, um, this will have to be found out. Um, my feeling would be uh, to lift all the um, limitations and just to see when we run into problems. And, and if it turns out that, that we need to place some restrictions, it's, it's a project decision on, on, on a high level. I mean, high level people will decide. And if users like you are unhappy with the decision, it's like a negotiation. That's how I anticipate. But just like this case that now came up in the discussion, there are so many decisions that still need to be made, right? This is the first prototype we are, so far, I'm, I'm super have, happy about how it went with a group of 40 users simultaneously. But, but it's, it's really the first shot and uh, there have to be many things to be further development and decisions to be taken. And I, I'm certain that the higher body who makes the decision will listen to uh, the requirements of users. So in some way it needs to be an a exchange. Any other questions? Um, so I was just wondering whether I, I should now have like a short hands-on where you experiment the export on your own and, and maybe also the quality control with derived variables before we step into visualization and, and maybe I'm, I'm doing this. So it will be like 16 minutes until half past two, uh, where you are on your own uh, practicing exports and practicing um, quality control with derived variables. And I would leave it to you where you spend most of the time. And like before, I'm, I would walk around in the room and, and see how it goes. And then we have one hour exactly left and I would spend the time to introduce the, the visualization and analysis capabilities, but also I would like to have maybe at least 15 minutes at the end just for discussion and gathering your feedback. Because I, I think really having this many users in the room, um, knowing what you liked and what you disliked, what worked and what didn't work and, and what you are missing Getting this feedback is, is essential. So my plan then, uh, 15 minutes practicing, then we go visualization, but leave 15 minutes at the end for this feedback period. Okay, so give it a try. Okay, so uh, the designed behavior of the export is that you get an email telling you you will receive a, the output in a zip file 
and the zip file actually will be placed in the home directory of your uh, private workspace. So if I go into the private workspace, um, it should be visible as a zip file here at the bottom. I'm not sure, did I actually trigger the export here? I'm, I'm just wondering whether I'm supposed to, to receive a zip file. So I, some people have received it already. Um, this is the intended um, procedure. I, I also have to say right now, the, the VRE has, not, has no way of unzipping a zip file so we wouldn't be able to do anything with the zip file right now, except downloading to your own system here, right? But ultimately, we would like to do the unzipping also in the VRE, and then if you have requested ODV collection, then you could open uh, the collection in the VRE, for instance. Or if you have requested NetCDF, the plan is, to pass it on to Diva in the VRE, right? Okay, still some uh, minutes to uh, practice. So um, I, I have feedback from Sebastian and he's confirming the extractor will write a zip file in the home directory of your um, private workspace, and you should have received an email um, announcing that there will be a zip file there. At least this is the um, designed behavior. <clears throat> he also explained why I did not receive a zip file, and that has to do with his final select, his filter. Whatever I'm choosing, he in the end will say, okay, whatever you have, you only get the data from last year. Just to minimize the size of the files here. And it can be that you are selecting a domain where, when there is no data from last year and, and then you would get nothing. And in this case, you will not get a zip file. Um, in the future, I mean, in the future, we will not have this uh, additional last minute filter. And um, we will make sure if your selection has no hits, if there's nothing passing, that you will be alerted as part of the process already so that you know about that nothing will come and give you a chance to, to change your selection. Okay. <clears throat> the next service. Um, Last chance to ask questions about what we did before, like QC with uh, derived variables and extractor. Any questions concerning extractor? No? Okay, so um, we go back to the VRE homepage, like this one. <clears throat> and we are now uh, dealing with the last service, the web ODV visualization that was not dealt with before. So everybody please click on web ODV visualization here. And it behaves very similar to this QC, um, uh, web ODV QC um, service. First step is um, you will see uh, your private workspace filtered for those files and directories containing ODV files because it's ODV collections that we can visualize and analyze. So in this case, um, we have such files in the imports directory left from your imports. In my case, I just did one import and some of you have three import directories containing um, ODV files. So they could be analyzed and visualized. But in the course material package, I have a specific data collection that I want you to use here. So open ODV course material, and then visualization. And then there's a file called save.odv. 
<clears throat> so just for your explanation, save doesn't mean uh, we need rescue, but um, this is data coming from an experiment, South Atlantic Ventilation Experiment. So that explains this name. It's a relatively small data collection, but covering an entire basin. And it's kind of nice for demonstrating visualization features. So this file needs to be checked, save.odv, <clears throat> and then we click on continue. Anybody having success already? So this is what we want to see, a map going up, showing the domain of this data set. South Atlantic, so we are not precisely in the sea data cloud <clears throat> regional domain, but uh, still in the Atlantic. And this is a data set that consists of several cruises that, that are nicely section-wise oriented. Okay. So can I see a show of hands who sees this map? Who does not? Too shy or? <laughs> while, while we are still waiting for some, there is one big difference that um, when in the visualization service, ODV will be opening the data set in read only. And that is indicated, if you look at the, the status bar here in the middle part, there's just an R indicating this file is now opened read-only. If you remember, and, and maybe when you try again, this QC um, service, there was RW meaning read-write. And of course, the write capability is important if we want to make changes, like flagging and so on. But all the other services, we are opening the data sets in read-only mode, which means you cannot corrupt the data set in, in this mode. So that's one reason why um, keep attention to the entire interface. And the status bar has, has important information. It also tells us, this data set being rather small, it just has 396 stations. Right now, we are looking at all of them. Uh, success on your side? No? No? So maybe for this part, uh, just watch over the shoulder of your neighbor and, and we uh, keep on going, right? <clears throat> Um, we, we learned already how to do uh, scatter windows. And that would also be possible with this one in the same way. Oh, I should say the visualization interface behaves very similar to the quality control interface with one exception. All the options that would allow you to write, like make changes, edit data, um, assign quality flags, they are grayed out, they are not available. They show, but they don't act. So for instance, put the mouse over these numbers, right click. You were expecting that edit data, edit sample data, or assign quality flags would be live, would be active. But all of these require writing to the collection, which deliberately we do not want. So don't be surprised. All these editing options, they are still there, but they do not act. And this is indicated by this grayish uh, color here. All the other options that can be satisfied by just reading the data, they are there, and that includes all the visualization that we are doing now, okay? So how do we get different kinds of graphics? <clears throat> and let us recreate um, 
the scatter windows we knew from the quality control. So we are changing the layout and this is done by uh, moving the mouse over the canvas, for instance here in the top part. Ah, no, I'm, I'm putting it here because, yeah. Put it on the lower right side, like here in the map. Right click and then layout templates. So the choices of the layout templates, it's a quite big um, di um, list, menu list. And if you start um, too high in the window, like if I did it here, layout templates, most of them are unavailable because they are hidden on the top. So that's how I do it. And um, these options like getting one, two or six scatter windows. This is the one, the favorite type of windows if you do quality control. This we did already. Now let us do uh, even simpler windows that are called station windows. And I'm going rather quickly, assuming that most of you know ODV uh, desktop and, and maybe most of you are familiar with all these layouts. Can I, can I see a show of hands who is familiar with all these different windows? Let's make the opposite, who is not familiar with these different windows. Okay, so it's just the fight that I go through. Um, scatter windows. This is the type of window that, sh that shows lots of data. It shows all the data of all the stations that are in the map. And that's why it's suitable for quality control. You see all the values. In contrast, these station windows, they show few data, but you have full control over which ones. And let's operate. So let's choose a layout that has six of them. So we can look at different parameters. Six station windows. That takes too long. Any uh, successes in the room? It's immediate, yeah. So in my case, I'm, I'm kind of stuck. Eventually, I mean, we are working on a system when what I did now should never be necessary, of course. Our ambition is that it's stable, but yeah, we are experimental here. Visualization. Okay. So it's a load issue. Uh, so what we are now having uh, is six station windows. They happen to be empty at the beginning because um, in this mode, we are choosing stations by hand. So you have full control over which one you want to see the data. So for instance, if we want to have a comparison of the data in different basins, we could choose a station in the East Atlantic, like this one. And then actually, if you read the text in these windows, it tells you what you have to do to add the data of this station to the plot. It, it means hitting the plus button. Once you hit the plus button, then you should see something like this. And if you want to add data from a different station, for instance, we want to compare how is the West Atlantic comparing to the East Atlantic, then you now choose a station in the West Atlantic and you hit plus again. And this is the whole principle. If, if we now also want to compare with um, more Antarctic, then I would choose a station, um, for instance, here in this region, hit plus again. And you already see that it happens that some data go off scale. They are no longer part of the window. So very often you will have to do full range. 
And in order to do it full range for all the windows, you put the mouse over the canvas, right click, full range. And, and now the ranges are opened so that you see all the data. So that's the principle of, of having these um, station windows. So that's kind of you fully control um, the stations for which you want to look at the data. You can still put any variable on X and Y. And the principle is, is the same as before. Mouse over a window, right click, X variable, and you choose what you put on the X variable. Um, variable. And similarly, um, the Y variable. So you have full control over what kind of plot you want. For the physical oceanographers, definitely you can make TS diagrams by, by just choosing the right variables on, on the axis. And these station windows, the characteristic is each one has a, a color and a symbol. So the first one, for instance, red dot. And in, in the data plots, it has this symbol and um, ah, here, red dot. And in the map, you can also see it as a red dot. So when you are wondering which profile belongs to which station, just look at color and symbols. Uh, that's basically all that needs to be known uh, for station uh, windows, full control. Any question concerning this? Then uh, let's move on and, and do sections, because very often uh, you have ship data following a certain ship track. For instance, what I'm highlighting with the mouse now, this meridional part. A ship just happened to take that course. And if we want to draw sections along the cruise, now let's define a section and then plot it. Um, so that's two steps. The first one is we need to define which track do we want to follow. And here is how you define it. A section is something that belongs to the map, so the mouse has to be over the map. Right click and then um, choose this option, Manage Section. And it has a, a submenu and we want to choose Define Section. Okay, everybody please who wants to follow on. Now notice the cursor now uh, when it's over the map, it's, it's crosshair, so it's expecting that we click points. So we go to the start of the section that we want to define, click to define the start, and then we move on as if we were following the ship. And any favorite section that I should do? I mean, everybody can, can do his her own section um, interactively, I, I will follow this meridional one. So I'm going to the end of the section and a little bit beyond. And here I left click the mouse. Now once this is done and, and you move the mouse, then this first point is the anchor. It has been defined. And now it's time to, to follow the ship track. So in regular mm, distances, just add more points as you are following the ship. And I'm doing it here. Um, so I go to this point, left click again. Now we have two points defined. It's very critical if the track makes a bend that you put a point in, in the bend point. That's very important. Otherwise, just stay on track as accurately as you can with your mouse. So in this case here, it, it's essential that I put a point in, in this band. Yeah, where the track changes direction. And otherwise, I'm, I'm just going my way. 
defining sections, it's, it's possible to have very complicated tracks. Sometimes you could have self-enclosing tracks. For instance, we could go from here, this way, up here, return and go south again. So that would give us an enclosing section. So it's, it's possible. It's, it's your decision on what the section should be. So in my case, that's all I need to, to define this meridional section. And I move the mouse here to the Apply button, down, and click the Apply button. Immediately, this Section Properties dialog comes up that allows you to set some properties, including, you, you could specify uh, a name. I know this track is, is known by oceanographers as A16. So I could say, well, this is the A16 line. Oops. Um, now what's very important, we need to specify which coordinate do we take along the section? And there are several choices. The default is distance from the beginning in kilometers. So the first point is uh, the starting point and the distance along this track in kilometers would be the coordinate. That's the default. But there are other choices and um, longitude and latitude are very popular alternatives. So in, in my case, because it's a meridional section, uh, latitude would be a good choice. But sometimes, if for instance you are following an Argo float that, that takes um, inside eddies, so it's a very complicated uh, structure, uh, distance is a valid choice, but the alternative could also be time. So especially when, when an, a float um, is locked in a, sp um, in a specific area, then distance is not changing much, but time is changing. And, and then you are, are better off choosing time as the coordinate. So that's a very important decision. So in, in my case, because it's a meridional section, I choose latitude. If I had defined a more zonal section, I would have chosen longitude. That's important. Then also uh, realize these sections, they're actually bands around the center line that we have clicked. And all the stations lying inside the band, they will be part of the section. So sometimes you want to have a very narrow band and sometimes you might want to have a very wide band. And you control this by changing the width here. And in my case, why not change it to 100 kilometers? Oops. Also very important, um, in these section plots that will come up, a bottom bathymetry will be uh, drawn. And you have a choice of what to use for the bathymetry. Um, in our case, uh, this GAPCO is not available because it's not installed on the server. But you could choose um, a bathymetry coming from um, Etopo, which is a big product, bathymetry product of the world. Or you could take um, the bathymetry from bottom depths of the stations. Let us experiment with um, a topo. And then you can choose a color for the bathymetry that will be plotted in a second. And, and there are lots of choices. But the default is what I consider nicest, to have a gray shade of the bathymetry. So if you like all these settings, then you press apply. And usually when you are used to it, then uh, it doesn't take long to set all these uh, properties. But, but here my feeling is not so good. This takes too long. Any success on your side? Also takes too long? So you realize uh, we still have lots of work to do. <clears throat> uh, 
Um, so in my case, I'm I'm just doing the brutal thing. I'm I'm stopping all all um, web ODV services and quickly go through it again without explain, explaining. And and maybe you want to do the same, or if you're just uh, exhausted, then just watch what I'm doing. So I'm stopping. Going back. So in, in, in this case, I'm, I'm defining the section in, in the big map, which sometimes you need to have a big map to be accurate enough with your mouse. So here I'm saying right click manage section, define the section, and then I go quickly. And here I'm I'm just changing this. Okay, it, it, it's a, for some reason it doesn't uh, like these delays and, and maybe it doesn't like when too many people are doing this uh, at the same time, which this is something we will fix. So now the section is defined and success means in the map there is this band drawn along the track that we have. Now we have a section. And here in this case, I'm now... Um, now we need to go to a layout that has so-called section windows. And one way to do it is mouse over the canvas, layout templates, and choosing one of these section layouts. And why not have three section windows? Um, <clears throat> so this is now the first uh, section window. Oh, down here they look they look like um, scatter windows, but actually only data from inside the section band are drawn here and here. And the the other section window here has the section coordinate on the x-axis, depth on the y coordinate, and then some variable we are interested in as z variable. I think this is the first time that we have a third variable here, which is called the z variable, this one. And that actually gives color to these points. So the color reflects temperature, reddish colors being high temperature, bluish magenta uh, low temperature. ODV has the philosophy when you set up a, um, a graphic for the first time, it's going into this honest mode, as I call it. Honest meaning at each location where there's a measurement, it puts a color dot, and here the color reflecting temperature. When there are gaps in the data, you would see it. There would be white areas, like for instance here in this region, no data. Honest. Sometimes you have big gaps. This is good coverage, so the gaps are not too large. But still, I, I consider this honest. I ask everybody using ODV, before doing more complicated graphics, as we will do now, to have looked at the honest one, so that, that you know where the gaps are. Also, if there was an outlier, like for instance, high temperatures here in the deep, you would see this red point in, in a magenta uh, environment. So I really like these honest plots. And, and these are what you get when you set up Windows for the first time. Um, this can be changed. And uh, let's learn how to modify this to have a, uh, a continuous field a so-called gridded field. 
And to manipulate this window, no surprise, you put the mouse over it, right click. And then we need to go to properties. And again, there, there are many pages on this uh, dialog. What we want to look at, display style. Again, those people who, who are familiar with ODV uh, desktop, this is the exact same behavior, right? So here on the display style, the present setting is original data. This is what I call honest. We now want to go to credit field. And um, in the interest of, of the server not being overwhelmed, I, I would ask you to stay with weighted average gridding. And this time, I'm the only one getting the privilege to go to Diva. And this is the Diva critting tool that, that you will learn about uh, tomorrow, I guess, um, built into ODV. And it can be activated. And I have to say it's a simplified version of Diva. Um, so I'm, I'm choosing this. It will put load on, on the server in Hamburg. So that's why I'm asking you not to do it. Um, but I want to show you um, the capabilities of, of Diva as it is built in into ODV. Um, and, and I click Apply. And everybody clicks Apply. So now, instead of having these uh, separate dots, it's now a continuous field. It's um, showing the locations of the data as dots. Uh, right now, it's, it's not showing contours, so let us learn how to add contours also. Mouse over this window, right click, properties again. Now go to this page, contours here. Yeah. And just to make it easy, um, click on this button, auto create. It's possible to define your own set of contour lines using um, the settings here, but I, I don't want to spend any time. If you want to learn, then um, look into the documentation of ODV uh, desktop. For now, I'm, I'm just using this button here, and it has auto-created a se um, series of uh, contour lines. And if I click Apply, uh, these contour lines now appear. And th there are some other um, nice uh, things that, that I'm just showing. So please watch me without the need that you do the same. Um, I want to change the color um, mapping. That's also below uh, properties. Um, under data, the z-axis entry has this color, color bar settings here. And I'm going into it. And I'm um, requesting that the mapping will be determined automatically by ODV, looking at what kind of distribution do the temperature data have. And I click Apply again. And it looks different now. There's, there's better resolution in the cold temperatures. Now you can distinguish clearly between 0, 1, and 2, when before it was just one color. right? So there are these capabilities that the desktop ODV also has. And a lot of these capabilities are available in this web interface. So you can go quite, quite far in this. Um, and, and I think this is all I, I want to say about uh, graphics. What, what today I, I have not touched at all are these ISO surface variables that you could use to make nice maps. But this is something we, we need to leave out here. So I'm suggesting that, that we have like seven minutes of, of you practice yourself trying to get your favorite graphics. And afterwards, we do this uh, feedback 
session. I'm, I'm so curious to, to hear what we need to do. Okay. Any questions up to this point? Okay. Just... Possible to use uh, a different cholera? Oh, yeah. <clears throat> so that's easy. Um, on, go to this window, right click on it, properties. So, this properties dialog that needs to be used for many, many, many things. Go to general page, the first one, and that has an entry which palette to use, which color palette. And maybe some of you are aware of this um, discussion about rainbow palette and some people are really dogmatic about hating it. And also um, the color impaired people, they have difficulty distinguishing these shades of red, yellow and so on. And there's a recommendation uh, by some important journals, for instance, Nature, now requires that uh, a different palette be used. And this is this Viridis palette, which is part of the ODV um, distribution. And changing the palette is as simple as changing this palette. Mm -hmm. Click apply, <clears throat> and this now looks totally different. And also, if, if you cannot afford um, paying the color charges to the journal, then you could choose a black and white palette also, if you like. Can I ask a question? Is there anybody in the room for who this properties dialog uh, does not fit on the screen entirely? Okay, so seems to be small enough. It's important that we reach the apply button. It needs to be visible, and obviously that's the case for all of you. Okay.
Just one addition. Um, in the station windows, I, I told you how to add the data of the current station, which is hitting the plus. So now I have done it twice to have two stations included. If you want to remove one, then click on it and then hit the minus button. Minus. Hmm. Doesn't work right now, but ah. Okay, hit the minus. And then you might be confused because the, the red highlighting is still staying. But if you click on the other station, then you really see it's it's no longer part of the plot itself. Um, <clears throat> so I suggest now that, that we uh, finish the, the hands-on. <clears throat> um, if, if the whole procedure has made you cur curious, that's basically all that we wanted to do, to, to show you <clears throat> the kind of advancement that these services have reached. Um, hopefully it came across that they are already useful. We still have to work on the stability and, and making this a robust uh, system, but this is already giving you an impression on where the whole thing is going. I, I would now very much uh, like to open this feedback um, part of the session and I would like to receive comments. I mean, if you have positive sides, don't hesitate to tell us how beautiful everything is. But but essentially, um, we want to know about what did not work, what was not intuitive, because the developers not always think like the users. And, and you are supposed to be the users, and, and things that don't behave as, as thought, it's important feedback that we would like to have. So I'm kind of opening the floor <clears throat> Don't be shy. Just just tell us what we have to do. And and now maybe we need to pass the microphone. No, huh? no uh, my question is that I simply cannot access the slides because I only find. No, but somebody should see that. Or during during the coffee break, I can try to find the reason. Everything is working okay, and only I cannot reach the. Okay, this this kind of specific thing I I can try to solve without making any promises. Are there other people? I mean, the present status, it, it cannot be the end of the whole thing, right? We, we want to develop further. Please. And um, maybe it would be good to, to distribute the microphone. <clears throat> maybe it's loud enough in the room, but, but the remote people, they will not be able to listen. I, I was just curious. Uh, do you have statistics on how it's being used uh, today? Like the VRE? Yeah, uh, no, yeah, both the ODB for desktop and I mean, what do people mostly use it for? You mean ODV in general, in, the desktop? Yeah, yeah. both. But the <clears throat> yes, we we have statistics and um, we are happy about the statistics. So we, we lock the, the website access 
to ODV, and on average we have 200 people every day visiting. I, I was thinking what, what features are used. used. How do they use it? Do they use it for quality control or visualization? Or, uh, this, this I don't have detailed information. I, I can judge from two sources. One is the publications that come out using ODV as graphics. And those people, they use well, all the graphics types that we have, sections being maybe um, very popular, and the maps that we did not cover today at all, they are popular. Uh, sometimes people just publish a cruise map made in ODV. The, the quality control work we actually never know about except in the project itself. Sea Data Cloud, we know that all the regional um, experts use ODV for quality control to some extent. Yeah, but I, I was wondering, because like, I was wondering what, what sort of, uh, how you consider which features to uh, uh, work on next depending on what people actually need or want. Yeah. So here in CData Cloud, I would definitely make it dependent on the requests coming from the project. We get finances from the project. This development is, is financed by CData Cloud. So we, we will listen very careful to what the project wants, like you. We also listen to other people, yes, of course. But, but, but this is finance from CData Cloud, so this has highest priority. And the coordinator likes this statement. <laughs> uh, well, maybe one feature can be interesting, uh, because uh, what does you do for all the need for produce data, data sets? We use, we put it in database and generate uh, ODVs from C data net uh, models too. Are there any plans to, uh, to uh, make features for ODV to compare uh, to uh, versions of the same ODV set and to extract only uh, quality uh, check changes? So that we, uh, for example, we can uh, download, uh, for example, some ODV set and uh, give to some uh, expert who will uh, mark what's uh, wrong data and then extract only uh, uh, that particular uh, marks into some list, uh, whatever, Excel or common separated value, and then based on that list to update database by other means. Um, there are some some parts that go into this direction. So the, the logging of all these changes, that, that is one important information. So we will have, and that's already part of the plan, we will um, make options in ODV to extract uh, quality flag changes made by certain person, maybe made on certain sessions, and, and separate the, um, the data center ETMO code of, of these changes so that they be sent to the different data centers. There are rudimentary um, capabilities already, but this is one thing that we want to make much easier to use in the future already. Um, whether this satisfies all the features that you have in mind? Hmm? I believe, I believe, because if I can get the track of changes, I can convert it somehow into database. So we will put a lot of emphasis on these logs and, and how to extract them, select among them, and so on. We also have a plan to allow undo of this quality flagging. So for instance, one use case, and I want to hear your impression. It could be that some of you in the morning started making quality control and maybe at lunchtime realized, oh damn, I, I, I did most of the stuff wrong. Because maybe I didn't realize this was river and it was real and I thought, oh, everything above 50 nitrate, 50 micromole nitrate is bad. 
So it can be that this happens. So we are thinking of features saying all the changes made since a certain day time uh, to undo them, something like this. And what you have in mind may be just alert a given data center that exactly these samples have been changed and, and just send these messages to, to this data center and make it like a button press operation, easy to use. This we have on our list. And that's part of hopefully the funded uh, C Data Cloud uh, 2 project, hopefully getting funded. So yes, we want to pay more attention on this. Okay. Room for other <coughs> suggestions. Yes, please. Uh, I have a fairly simple one, uh, simple observations from the stuff that we did today. Would it be possible to add, add in this uh, virtual environment and everything, like the recently opened tab, tab or something, something like that? Because in the morning section, we worked with the uh, quality control, we did it. And then when we had to open it again, the next time we have to navigate back to the same file and open that file. Like remembering the state before lunch and so that after lunch you can come back. Remembering the file was the last time you opened. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure. Um, that the VRE designers uh, will will take that serious. Yeah, I... So in in the um, I mean this visualization service of ODV here is embedded into the VRE. Um, I also have it like run on a simpler server and, and there I, I have this memory already. So if before lunch you, you close the session in a specific state and you come back after lunch, you get exactly the same state. So that goes into that way. This kind of feature now has to be brought into the VRE as well. And not only with web ODV, but in general, the other services as well, including private workspace, maybe. Yeah, I, I've put it down. I, I would say this is mostly the, the high-level VRE designers that have to do it. Yes, please. Uh, is it possible to link in some way to, for example, this particular view? with this particular data highlighted? Like if we now, now work in the cloud with different collaborators, if you find something strange, it might be useful to say, hey, here's a link, that this link really uh, locates this view and this highlighted point. Is that possible or? So, um, I'm, so we thought about this right now this is like isolated working. So everybody was working in isolation. And, and there are good reasons sometimes you, you want to do exactly this. Because maybe you have precious data and you don't want to share at this point. Yes. Um, we have thought about it and actually it's in the proposal for C Data Cloud 2 to allow what we call collaborative editing. So we want to reach the state where, for instance, the Mediterranean data set will be edited online by not just one person, but, but several people at the same time and, and perform editing. That requires that, that there needs to be a notification system among these people. So when one, one is changing uh, data, this needs to be transmitted to the other ones. So we have plans, but I, I would say this will not happen maybe until two years time, but it's on the agenda. We know how, how much people like to, to edit Google doc documents and, and several people can work on the same document at the same time. 
Technically, we, we know it will be possible, but um, we need to think about this notification system. And it needs to be, um, well, good so that other people are informed, but we also need to, to keep the, the necessary bandwidth under control. So not, not any single change. Uh, it, we must prevent that it triggers complete redrawing and, and these kind of things. So, yes, we have it on the plan. But this is something very challenging. And on a very simplified way, is there a link or a way to save this particular view with this? Oh, yeah. So actually, um, this is already possible. So if you looked at the, the canvas menu, um, we have the load view, so it, it's able to see a list of views that exist, and you choose one. But it also has a safe view as. So it's possible if you have your specialized setup that you save it under a name. But the solution we have right now is, is not the optimal one. Presently, it's saved in, in your browser data space. And it will survive as long as you don't delete browser data. Once you have, like in Chrome or in Firefox, at some point, you can delete your browser cookies and all this kind of stuff. Once you do it, then presently uh, your saved views are lost. And, and this is not a good solution. So we will change it. This is something I, I would say this is available maybe in six months time. Okay. Uh, more comments. We still have some time. I'm, I'm, I'm still happy for those people who, who um, have comments when you are on your trip back. Uh, still write it down. I'm, I'm happy to receive it. Either send this by email to me or if you are lazy, just take a photograph of that sheet of paper and, and send me the photograph. I, I think this is really important. We have so many testers and, and people who have anticipation. So even if you don't know what to say here, uh, but on your way back, for instance, do it. But, but we still have uh, maybe one more. So m mostly people are happy, I, I guess. Uh, just honestly, um, we teachers and, and the developers of the VRE, I, I think up to this point, we are super happy because uh, there was reason for being nervous. Just, just realize this setup and this kind of integration was, was done quite recently and in no way could we encounter the full space of possibilities. But uh, having all of you uh, wildly, I, I saw you operating uh, the interface in a speed that I, uh, makes me mind-boggling, and, and the system still surviving in, in some way, mm, I, I find it good. So uh, I, I would like to close now the web ODF part of the session. Thank you all for putting so much energy in, and um, I think we all can hope for even a more stable and, and better system in the future. Thanks a lot.